we're number one in violence. It seems ready to break out at any moment in any place in America. He entered the facility heavily armed, immediately started shooting everybody. And uh, uh, the customers uh, that were inside the uh, restaurant uh, had absolutely no chance to escape. These images are more of war than of a small fast food restaurant in San Ysidro. Yet it was a local man dressed in battle fatigues who declared, I have killed a thousand, I'm going to kill a thousand more. 41-year-old James Huberty reportedly walked into the restaurant carrying a semi-automatic rifle and two other weapons, enough ammunition to last two hours. Witnesses inside said he fired wildly into the unsuspecting crowd gathered for a quick evening meal. He fired through windows, hitting people in the street. He fired at men, women, children, and babies. One officer said it looked like a mass execution. Forty bystanders were shot. 21 died in the biggest mass murder in American history. What kind of man can walk into a crowded restaurant and try to kill everyone in sight? I think everybody thinks this couldn't happen to them. It's like something you would see on TV that's far away from you, totally removed. But it happened, and it involves me. And like I said, a lot of people think, hey, it couldn't happen to me. I disagree. I think it could violence is as American as apple pie. 1972, at a political rally, presidential candidate George Wallace is shot by a man named Arthur Bremer. American assassins shoot political figures, not for political motives, but for their own personal reasons. There were very profound sort of personal, emotional problems that were bothering people, and uh, they chose this as a way to resolve those personal problems. Violence can strike anywhere at anyone. Anonymous killers striking without provocation can make a car breakdown or a hitched ride a matter of life and death. There are thousands of such murders every year. This man, Henry Lee Lucas, claims to have killed 360 people in 36 states over just eight years. I guess you'd say it's like eating for some people. They have to do it to live. And that's the way I felt. I had to do it to live. We are a violent nation. Each year, there are one and a quarter million acts of violence. That means each of us runs a one in 200 chance of being the victim of a violent crime this year. 20,000 times a year that crime is murder, which happens here in America more often than anywhere else except the killing fields of the third world. The most dramatic acts of violence, mass murder, assassination, multiple murder, have become commonplace. Why? This program examines three people who have committed such crimes mass murderer James Huberty, would-be assassin John Hinckley, and multiple murderer Henry Lee Lucas. In the next hour, we will try to understand what made these men commit such bizarre acts of violence, and why those forms of violence are particularly American. Given a population of 200 and some million people, uh, there are a certain proportion of people who are angry. Uh, they're angry because of the frustrations inherent in an open society, a very competitive society, a society that prides itself on the notions of equality, of freedom, and so forth, and yet they're not making it. We also have a society that is heavily armed with handguns that are easily concealed. And from time to time, a person, instead of lashing out directly at some frustrating person or object in their life, they'll strike out at a symbol of authority, like a president, like a McDonald's restaurant. The peculiarly American reaction of frustration and anger led to an outburst of violence of major proportions in San Diego, July 18, 1984. 21 people died in what became the biggest mass murder in American history. The victims were men, women, and children from eight months to 74 years of age. 
That day was a Wednesday, a pleasant Southern California day. At four o'clock, McDonald's was crowded with 50 people taking an afternoon break when an armed man walked in and began shooting. San Diego Police Lieutenant Paul Iberando. When he entered the building, he had three weapons with him, uh, two shoulder weapons and a nine millimeter semi-automatic uh, pistol. Uh, I have them here. What did he do? He came in, he had this weapon, which is an Uzi uh, semi-automatic carbine uh, in his hand. Uh, he also had a nine millimeter semi-automatic pistol. It's a Browning. And he had a Winchester pump action 12 gauge shotgun with him. When he came in, uh, after ordering the people uh, to get down on the floor, he started firing the weapons. Uh, we've determined that the Uzi was his primary weapon. Uh, he did most of the firing with that. After a while, he started playing the radio, and, and he was just shooting around at anything. Me and three girls and two other friends of mine were back there. You couldn't really tell what he was shooting at, because I was in the back. I work in the back. And then everybody just went to the floor. I was back there for quite a long time. After 40 minutes or so, that's when he went back there. And that's when he started shooting at us. And I just I just started trying to run and stuff. I, I couldn't, and I got shot. I went down to the basement after I was shot, and I was hiding in the closet until it was over. He never came downstairs? No. For an hour and 17 minutes, a killer controlled McDonald's and kept 175 police pinned down outside. They didn't have a target. Uh, they were totally pinned down. Uh, any movement towards the building may have caused him to, to indiscriminately shoot and kill other people within the building. Uh, it was a sort of a no-win situation at that time. At last, at 5.17 p.m., the police SWAT team got its chance. One officer drew fire at this window. Another on the post office roof fired one shot from his sniper rifle, and the killer went down, shot through the heart. Officer Miguel Rosario went in with the SWAT team. First thing I saw was a lady laying uh, in front of the counter uh, with a uh, six-month-year-old baby laying, laying in her lap. And I assume it was a husband laying right next to her and uh, you could tell it was a family. And they had been shot numerous times. And uh, that was horrible. It was just people who were eating and obviously had been shot. Some looked like they didn't know what happened. No time to react. They were hit uh, by surprise. Uh, some people were still clutching hamburgers. Some people still clutching trays. Some people had uh, patched up their wounds with uh, uh, napkins. Of the 40 people shot, 19 survived. One was high school student Albert Leos. How many times were you shot? Four. What are you angriest about? Well, I just wish I wasn't bit, wouldn't have been there at the time, that's all. To, you know, but there was nothing we could do about it, because it could have happened anywhere. 11-year-old Josh Coleman was coming up the driveway with two friends. As you were going toward McDonald's, did you have any idea something was happening there? No. Did anyone yell at you or something? Yeah, from across the street, a man yelled at us. What do you think? I didn't understand what he was saying. Yeah. Where were you hit? All on my arm and on my back and right here. When did you realize that your friends were dead? My mom told me in the hospital. What happened to your friends? Ah, uh, they died. All five? No, three of them. Three girls. When nobody came to help you, what did you think about doing next? Just laying there and wait. And most people talked about trying to play dead so he wouldn't know that they were still alive and, and shoot at him. Did you think of that by yourself? Mm-hmm. How come? I don't know. It's pretty smart. Don't you think? <laughs> Another young lady who was with a group of five people uh, was wounded. All the other people in her party were actually killed. Uh, she said that uh, she made the mistake of opening her eyes and 
looking directly at the suspect. He realized she was alive. Uh, he threw food at her, swore at her, and then sprayed her and the rest of her party again with, uh, with bullets. And at that point, she was wounded a second time, and she really did play dead at that point. She didn't open her eyes again until the officers arrived. What kind of man could carry out such violence? The dead killer was identified as 41-year-old James Oliver Huberty. He was a college graduate, a skilled worker, and a property owner who had recently moved to the neighborhood. The Huberty apartment was just half a block from McDonald's and in full view of it. Jim Huberty, his wife Etna, and their daughters, Zelia and Cassandra, were from Ohio. They had owned a small apartment house, and Jim worked as a welder for Babcock and Wilcox. Plant closings cost Huberty his job, so in 1983, the family packed up and moved west. They were hoping to make a fresh start, but it wasn't going well. In December, they had settled in San Isidro, a largely Hispanic section of San Diego near the Mexican border, which Jim didn't like. In early July, he lost his job as a security guard, but still the family was far from destitute. That day, July 18th, started well enough. It included a visit to the San Diego Zoo. We'd had a very good time that day. And we went to McDonald's, had chicken McNuggets, french fries, some Cokes. And we went to the zoo. And uh, we came home, and I, he went upstairs, and I was downstairs putting away the dishes. Uh, Zulia had come downstairs and told me he was messing around with some ammunition. But, I mean, that's nothing unusual. I got things cleared up in the kitchen, went upstairs. I was hot, tired. The bedroom door was closed. So I just went into the other bedroom and stretched out on the bottom bunk. What happened then? Well, I was resting. He came to the doorway, and uh, he said he was going to kiss me goodbye. I said, OK. And he started to walk away, and I just motioned for him to come back. He said, what? I said, well, I'll kiss you goodbye. He did. And uh, he made reference to he was going hunting. He said, I'm going to hunt humans. And uh, I didn't pay attention to him. Well, I felt, you know, he used to um, do things to get me excited. And figure he can make me cry or get me upset. <laughs> and I just decided he wasn't going to. And he just um, pointed thumbs up and took off. So I was going to get some ground beef because it was on sale at Safeway and I had to pick up the mail and a lot of different errands to do. So I just got dressed and told Zoe to come on and we went. And uh, when I came back, the roads, the highway was blocked off. My sister is still babysitting, so we had to come back to get her. And as we walked by, you could hear the gunshots. It's really, people were screaming and yelling. really bad. I saw the little, the little Flores boy. He was um, flopped over his uh, bicycle, bloody. And then there were other people out. And, and there are two others just laying down yes, on the sidewalk um, shot. And then you could see into the patio. How did you feel right then? Huh. <laughs> Stunned. Confused. It seemed like a TV show. You know, where you go to sleep on the sofa and you wake up. <laughs> yeah, it seemed like I should wake up. But this was just something on the television. On that date, I was in church. We had a Bible study and prayer meeting. And uh, I had a feeling of heaviness in my heart all that time I was there, that there was something wrong. And I prayed for my son that everything would be all right. I went home and... Uh, Next morning at 6 o'clock, I turned on the news on the radio beside my bed, and I heard what happened then. And boy, that really floored me when I heard that. That's pretty hard on anyone, something like that. I came in, and I fell down on the floor here. I knocked me out. I never got over it. But the most comfort I get is from my uh, friends over at the church, and my belief in God that helps me. Jim Huberty's father painted this mural in his church. I painted uh, 11 white sheep and a good shepherd there patting one on the head 
and uh, I painted a black sheep walking away from the flock. And I thought to myself, that one's gonna be in trouble. And I was thinking of Jim. Well, I showed you pictures of uh, him when he was a small child, going on uh, four years old, I believe. He has braces on his legs. Were you close? Yes. I wish I could have been with him more. But I went to work, and every afternoon I was on a shift where I had to be away. Jim's parents were divorced, a rarity in the 1950s. Jim, uh, I think he wished his mother had come along, and I had wished the same thing, but she didn't want to come. She said she wanted to be a missionary. Brother David Lombardi was Etna's minister. Before marrying the two of them in 1965, he spent time counseling Jim Huberty. Well, after about seven months of counseling with Jim, finally he just sat up and became very aroused. And he said, what kind of a god would take the mother of an eight-year-old child? You know, that just rocked me on my heels. I didn't know what he meant. What kind of a god would take a mother of an eight-year-old boy? Did Jim ever come <clears throat> to terms with that uh, experience? I really don't think so. It was the beginning of his trouble about his mother, and I think it just left an open wound inside that was built on. Other bad experiences just reinforced that. You said that, that Jim had some violent spells earlier in his life. Yes. What violent things did he do? He liked to break things up. When things weren't going his way, he'd just have a rampage, go through the house and break things up. How was he with the girls? Pretty good. Most of the time. Did he ever hit them? Yes. In a... in an extreme way or not? Depends what you call extreme. Tell me what you thought of that. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Did he ever hit you? Yes. Now, ask me if I ever hit him. Did you ever hit him? Of course. <laughs> 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 well, if you want to know if we've had some bad fights, we had to remodel one house because I was beating on him with a kitchen chair. And um, all of a sudden, I st he got a hold of it, and I started losing control of the chair, so I threw it, and it went through the wall. Oh, yeah. It worked both ways. He met his match in her, and uh, when you meet your match, why, then you're in for something strong. And in this case, it got to violence. Jim Huberty's first job after college was meant to get him into a profession. Don Williams took him on as an apprentice undertaker. At first, uh, I thought, well, I've got a real challenge cut out here and everything. And when I found out that it was really a challenge and more, I mean, I like a challenge, but it was just more than I could handle because of his temperament. He would almost uh, go hide in the garage or something when he knew a family were coming in for arrangements or something. Did you ever ask him why? No, because uh, he was sort of hot-tempered at times, and that would flare him up, and he'd just sort of stare in the eye and look down at the ground and walk off in a fast pace. This all happened in a middle-class neighborhood in the town of Maslin, Ohio, in the heart of Middle America. Trying to understand more about Jim Huberty, we asked Denny Hyben, a reporter for the local paper, to tell us about his hometown. I would consider Maslin a relatively typical town. It's got its share of uh, liberals, its share of conservatives. We've probably gotten more bars than we do churches, which some people wouldn't take kindly to, but that's the way it is. And most people prefer to live their own lives quietly and uh, don't speak out unless something affects them directly. There's a, a strong element of uh, John Wayneism or machismo, yeah. Uh, Masson has his own particular version. I'm sure it does. they have it in other steel towns, you know. Uh, we call it the mass and steel mentality sometimes, you know, it's a joke. You get out of high school, you get a job, you get a wife, you have a family, and you play sports and drink, you know. Have a few beers, play some softball. And that's that's the, the good life. For 
football is a passion in Maslin. That's, that's a good word for it, a passion in Maslin, yes. The people love football. They love the Friday nights during the autumn when the, the local high school team's playing. Uh, how high do those passions run? Does it get to fighting? Occasionally, yeah, there is a, there's a fight or two. The losing team, there'll be one or two guys that'll get out of line and start swinging. That's not really that bad, though. Uh, we'd like to joke about it. What do people around here dream about attaining? I mean, what's the goal in life? The goal in life? Probably the same everywhere, you know. You have enough money to cover your bills and a little bit left over. You know? So you don't have to lay awake at night and worry. And uh, there's been a lot of laying awake at nights and worrying, you know, through the recession here. Reagan's recovery hasn't caught up to Maslin or Northeastern Ohio as a whole. Do you blame someone? Yes. But I don't know if you really want to know. I blame uh, Mr. Carter when he got on the air and asked the Federal Reserve Board to raise the interest rates. He killed Northeastern Ohio. In a way, he killed Jim, and he killed those 21 people down there. So Babcox and Wilcox closed up. Jim saw 13 and a half years go down the drain. Made him very bitter, very angry. Uh, he sat around and brooded. What was he like before he lost his job? A lot different. There were a lot more happy times. He, as long as James could bring home a uh, paycheck and had no problems meeting his bills and could have good times without worries, uh, he was very happy. Did you feel in some sense you'd been kicked out of the middle class? <laughs> you mean like there was... Have you ever gone to where they wreck cars? and watch the little thing come down and squeeze. Yes, we were definitely squeezed. And we didn't even have time to get the battery out. <laughs> definitely. The Uberties felt squeezed out of the middle class. Would that cause violent behavior? Depends on what their coping resources are. For many people, it's a cue to find another job and to prioritize their problems. Some people, however, and thankfully not the majority, respond to those situations with violence. So we have to ask ourselves, what's the difference between the people who respond to that situation violently and the people who respond in more adaptive ways, or at least less socially destructive ways? Well, one of those differences has to do with one's accustomed means of problem solving. Well, in the case of Jim Uberty, he was used to breaking up the furniture or hitting his wife or children or going off in the hills and shooting at targets. People are creatures of habit. But if one's custom has been to solve problems through violence, then those are the patterns that are likely to be used. There are people a lot poorer than you've become, and yet... Um, they haven't done this. They haven't struggled that hard to get something. They didn't put as much effort into it to have as much. So they don't feel the bite as badly when they start to lose it. You know, if you, you don't miss what you haven't had. And you had it. Right. Well, would you say that was a successful man by standards here? Well, having a solid job in a, in a mill, yeah, successful. How about the you real estate? more than I make as a reporter. They used to have their little picnic table right out here outside our kitchen window. And they would, every weekend, they grilled steaks, and we were making hamburgers. So I guess, you know, we're looking out there and we're saying, well, they, they def definitely were more successful than I was. By 29 years old, I had my first child. I had a six-unit apartment house, a seven-room single home, a duplex, um, another little single-family home. I had a solid oak bedroom set with pecan veneer. I liked it. I really didn't know what else I wanted. My uh, husband always told me I thought too small. I probably do. He always tried to make the most out of life. and He wanted to be a success. Perhaps he put the wrong things first, you know. And I don't think he was too happy. Are you still a believer in the American dream, being rich, being affluent, enjoying life? Today's economy? I believe some people can make it. The 
most people, the average person, hang it up. In America, we pretend as though everyone has complete mobility, that through achievement they can rise to the top, that through lack of achievement they can fall to the bottom. But it isn't true. There are barriers to mobility, even in America. And failing to recognize that leads many people to have their dreams quashed, their hopes unfulfilled. The Huberties seem to have attained their dream, decent income, real property. But some of their neighbors saw signs of trouble. On one occasion, there was this woman and the girl next door to me were sitting at the picnic table out in the back. And Jim had a weird sense of humor. He came outside with this rifle with a scope on it and was just standing there with it aimed on him. And they both turned, I mean, completely white. He stood there for a couple minutes, and they dropped the gun and laughed real hard and went back in the house. He loved guns, and he liked to hunt. Groundhogs and rabbits. From about 14 or 15 on, he seemed to like it pretty well. Uh, another thing that spurred his interest in guns was his great uncle, Oliver Huberty, invented the Lewis machine gun and worked on the cooling system for the Browning automatic and other guns. It's easy to kill somebody with a gun. It's much more difficult. It takes more time, it takes more energy, it takes more skill to kill somebody with a rope, to kill somebody with a knife. It's an easy way to resolve a problem when you're in a highly emotional state. Are people around here gun lovers? There are a lot of uh, sportsmen's clubs around the area, a lot of hunters who are good hunters, well-trained, they know how to handle their guns, you know. And there are some who are, who are crackers, you know, and will go out with a gun in their belt to go to the bars just because they think they're tough. Was Jim tough? Physically, yes. Emotionally. Depends what you call toughness. Um, maybe he wasn't tough enough to change. And maybe he'd worked hard enough that he was tired. He kept saying, you know, that if a tree won't bend, it'll break. And it seems to me that he's the one that broke. I don't think he ever expected that. I think he thought I would. In Ohio, the Huberties felt protected and secure in their own house. I didn't bother the outside as long as they didn't bother me. I intended to stay in that house, die in that house, be cremated, and then put my ashes down in the basement in a box. In that basement, Jim kept his gun collection active, taking target practice against this wall whenever he felt frustrated. After Jim lost his job, the Huberties put their house on the market. David Smith bought it from them. Were they fond of the house? There was, yeah, they were real fond of it, and they didn't make any bones about letting you know how much money they'd spent on it. There was a lot of things in here that I knew that I was going to change because I wasn't going to live like this with heavy drapes around. In broad daylight, you have to turn the light on so that you can see where you're going through the hallways of the house. Did you ask them why they did that? They seemed like they were scared. The Huberties were very protective of their house and children. They kept three big dogs and owned seven guns, all legal. One fall day in 1981, Etna had a run-in with some of her neighbors. I was extremely provoked. I had neighbors who could provoke anyone. I got a feeling they could even provoke Job. I came to the window. Yes, there were five women and one child on the fence. Awakened by a commotion and shouting, Etna thought someone was picking on her younger daughter, Cassandra. She came to the window and pointed a cocked and loaded automatic pistol at the group. It was the same 9mm Browning Jim would use in California. Etna was arrested and spent the night in jail. Later, the judge released her and the gun in Jim's custody. Up until that incident, I felt that she was keeping Jim under control. And then after that, I sort of wondered, you know, whether who was keeping who under control. It would be nice if I could be calm, cool, collected, um, unattached. Ah, uh, that sounds very good. And it would probably be very nice. And it would make my former neighbors very happy. 
but I'm afraid I'm not that way. My father was born in Kentucky, and down there, they take care of things himself. If you beat up my kid, I'll beat up your kid. You know, it's tit for tat. You kill my dog, I'm definitely going to kill your cat. And did Jim feel the same way? He was just smarter about it. <laughs> in most cases, he'd go about it in a very sneaky little way and get away with it, whereas I just right now and get caught. You see, my nickname for him was the snake. He says, tell me everything you know about botulism. And so, you know, I, I told him what it was and everything, and he goes, well, that's not what I mean. He says, um, just tell me what foods would get botulism in at the fastest. He goes, and what kind of a dinner I could prepare and invite a bunch of people over, you know. He goes, I got some people I'd like to give a good dinner filled up with botulism. You thought he'd strike back at somebody? Definitely. But I mean, you know, if somebody had aggravated him, yes, yes. Why get even at random? This is what I cannot figure out. If he went back and killed some of the neighbors, it wouldn't surprise me at all. You ever think of him as being a killer? Yes. Yeah, I did. I, I, sometimes I thought, just like you say, they were pulling my leg. Because they kind of had a grudge against the world a lot of times and against people. And he made some threats at me, and my wife was pretty worried about it. I wasn't so worried, but, because uh, I really didn't think he was, and I thought he was all wind, you know. Jim did go and shoot 40 people. Yes, he did. And I think he was a sick person. I don't think that uh, he was in his right mind. Did you ever have any fear that he would kill someone? Oh, I figured one of us would probably kill each other. It's just a matter of time to who killed who first. Mrs. Huberty has said that she thought that Either Jim would kill her or she would kill him, and that she wouldn't be surprised if he'd killed some neighbors against whom he had a grudge, but that she couldn't figure out the reason why he would kill innocent people in McDonald's. Do you have a, an idea why? McDonald's is where the families are. I think it would be a mistake to conclude that the fact that none of his family members died in the attack indicated that his family was uninvolved. For those who kill multiple strangers on a single day, there are, is no single description that fits all of them. Some are very much like the men who kill their families, only they've displaced their aggression from their own family to other person's families. Why did he not kill you? I always more or less figured he really couldn't. Now, exactly why, I don't know. But I just don't think he really could. I think he just wanted to die. That could have well be one of the reasons behind it, because before we left Ohio, he had sat on the rounded section of the sofa in the living room. He had a silver revolver in his hand, and he had it to his head. And, um, I ran across the room and grabbed his arm and forced it down on the sofa and pried his fingers off of the gun. If I know, knew what was going to happen, definitely knew what was going to happen, no matter how hard it would have been, I would have tried to lean against the archway and let him do it. What was bothering Huberty was a society that he wanted to fit into, but didn't. And so he wanted to share in that society, whether it was sharing chicken McDuggets or, or Big Macs or whatever, but there were other aspects of his life that didn't permit that. And so who would he lash out against? Who would he direct this anger and this frustration toward? Would be those people who were enjoying the life, enjoying the Big Macs that he wasn't able to enjoy. Did he have any sort of quarrel with McDonald's? Not that I know of. Uh, he was irritated a couple nights earlier, one night earlier, with McDonald's down there because they didn't get their ice cream machine fixed. He didn't like the haphazard way they um, went about it. He figured they should order some new parts and do it right. 
Uh, I think we just have a case of a, a mentally disturbed person that finally exploded after 41 years of life, uh, a, a ticking time bomb that finally went off. But I think we have to realize that we might have a lot of these time bombs walking around. Every community has people that are right on the edge, and uh, they can't cope with the fr daily frustrations. They can't cope with something, things that happen in their life, and we see it all the time. Do you have any idea why? Why violence is the response to despair or disappointment? I can give you a very simple answer. I used to have German Shepherds. And if I took them, took them to the park before they ate, there were a tremendous amount of dog fights. If I fed them first, they were satisfied and they didn't fight. And humans, even though we have souls, inner beings, whatever, are basically animals. And we have basic needs. Food, shelter, clothing, love. And if all of these things are taken away, just like a dog, they'll become violent. And I know <laughs> ministers, educators, um, many people don't like to feel that they're animals. Don't like to think that we're this way, that we're all cultured, educated. I think the word is civilized, and we won't do this. But I think they're only kidding themselves. Aggression is rewarded in this country. Aggression is associated with success. The competition and aggression which characterize a capitalist free enterprise society like ours lends itself in an ultimate way uh, to a higher rate of violence. Because when we are aggressive and our goals are blocked, uh, then violence is one alternative. It's one alternative to failure in the view of, of some people. The American need to succeed creates great pressure on people like Huberty who feel they are outcasts. Others may also choose violent ways to relieve that pressure. American assassins, like some mass murderers, seem to have a grievance against society in general, which they attach to almost any political figure. Similarly, Huberty might have become an assassin if he had focused his anger on some political target. Did he ever mention any target, you know, any group, anybody who was causing all of this misery? The elite who had money who could uh, operate your government without uh, being in office. Sounds a little communist. No, my husband was not a communist. He was far right, extreme right. Who were his heroes? Hmm. He seemed to think Hitler was very intelligent. We asked Professor Clark if Jim Huberty's political ideas could have made him an assassin. I think that's quite possible, quite possible. Uh, he, he was uh, very similar to, to Arthur Bremer in that sense, as a person lashing out at a symbol of, of society. Both grew up in an emotionally deprived environment. Uh, people who were not really able to relate to other persons in terms of the normal warmth and emotions we associate with love, empathy, and caring. And that was a source of enormous frustration, I think, in, in the lives of both of those men. Like Jim Huberty, Arthur Bremer had a hard time fitting in, although he did play high school football. At 21, he lived in a small apartment in Milwaukee and kept a troubled diary. Like Huberty, Bremer thought of mass murder. He planned on shooting commuters at random during the rush hour. But then political figures attracted his attention. He attended rally after rally in 1972, first stalking President Nixon, then going after populist George Wallace. I did represent more of the average citizen in this country than did any other candidate. To Bremer, Wallace represented society at large, a society he hated because it rejected him. What they wanted to do 
was to express their contempt in this outrageous, perverse way for society. And I think that has a lot to do with the prevalence of uh, assassination attempts and successful assassinations committed by persons who aren't, in, in a real sense, that political. Beginning in 1963, when President John F. Kennedy was killed by Lee Harvey Oswald, who was himself assassinated, there have been seven major assassination attempts, as many as in the preceding hundred years. In 1968, Sirhan Sirhan killed Senator Robert Kennedy. Reverend Martin Luther King was assassinated that same year. In 1972, Bremer shot Wallace. In 1975, President Gerald Ford was the target of a gun wielded by this woman, Squeaky Fromm, seeking publicity for Charles Manson. The same month, another woman, Sarah Jane Moore, took a shot at Ford and missed. And in 1981, President Reagan was shot by a young man named John W. Hinckley, Jr. Five of these were attacks on political figures made without a clear political motive. Personal problems, but with public consequences. Do assassins inspire each other? I, I, I think there's no doubt about it. That uh, in every assassin that I've studied since Oswald, there was a conscious and explicit interest in the lives of earlier assassins. And there was a particular link between Hinckley and Bremer, was there not? That's right. There was uh, the link between Hinckley and Bremer was the fact that uh, Bremer's diary had inspired the movie Taxi Driver. There were dramatic similarities between the main character in that film played by Robert De Niro and Arthur Bremer. Uh, Hinckley, of course, identified with that character as we learned, you know, in, uh, at his trial. In the film Taxi Driver, Robert De Niro plays a disaffected loner. Just as Bremer had done, the De Niro character stalks a political figure. Foiled in assassination, the taxi driver becomes obsessed with a young prostitute played by Jodie Foster. And of course he takes the law into his own hands and this bizarre scene of just head-turning violence uh, uh, annihilates uh, pimps and prostitutes and so forth in this, in this scene. One young man who saw this film 15 times was fascinated by the characters played by De Niro and by Jodie Foster. He was John W. Hinckley Jr., who in 1981 shot President Ronald Reagan and three others. Hinckley was the 22-year-old son of a Colorado oil executive, a millionaire. Hinckley Jr. was a dropout, a failure. He decided the only way to succeed was by becoming famous. In trying to kill someone as famous and successful as President Reagan, he guaranteed he would make an impact on those he wanted to impress. His family and actress Jodie Foster. He was going to elevate himself through an act of violence into the public eye in a way that neither his parents nor Miss Foster could ever ignore. He puts you here and then he runs around with a big tongue. One thing that passes through the mind of a number of assassins and a number of mass murderers is the place that one will have in history as a result of this behavior. John Hinckley considered the amount of publicity that would arise from a mass murder on the Yale campus. He considered the amount of publicity that would arise from a murder-suicide with Jodie Foster. One reason he chose the one he chose was that his research had indicated to him that that did indeed achieve the highest publicity. Now, publicity is not always a concern, right? Well, it's certainly uh, a concern in many of the recent assassinations and assassination attempts in this country. Our assassins have not, for the most part, had rational political bases for their attacks. Out of seven serious attempts where weapons were actually fired, five of those seven were carried out by people who were emotionally disturbed. And the reasons that uh, they did this had to do primarily with, with very personal as opposed to, to uh, political concerns. 
A sexual obsession with Jodie Foster formed part of Hinckley's motive to kill Reagan, even though neither president nor actress had provoked an attack. Many other victims who become targets of assassins or other murderers do nothing personal to provoke their vicious murders at the hands of strangers. Killings by strangers account for more than 4,000 a year dead. Some killings are done for profit or an unknown reason. Some are done in a rage. Others are a source of sexual pleasure to the murderer. One man who was killed for all those reasons is Henry Lee Lucas, a drifter who has murdered men, women, and children all across this country. He claims 360 victims in eight years, by far the largest number killed by any one person, and more than the total number of murders committed in all of Denmark over the same eight-year period. Despite Lucas's appearance, many victims went with him willingly. I don't know whether it's me or whether I look trusted or what, I don't know, but uh, they get in the car. It's, uh, and I go up and knock on people's doors and tell them I'm hungry, tell them I want to drink water, they invite me right in their house. And, uh, I say, come on in, yeah, come on. Mm -hmm. Which is the worst mistake they make. I didn't want to end up being a criminal, but I ended up that way because of uh, different things I had to do in life and trying to survive. Criminal is one thing, murder is something else. Yeah. Well, one led to another, and uh, it's uh, when you can't leave a victim behind, you know, to identify you, uh, it becomes murder. You've killed 360 or more people in how long a period? Well, it's been 30 years when I first started. Uh, it's a good 30 years ago when I first started. But the last uh, nine or 10 years has been the worst since 75. It's been the worst, uh, worst time of my life. In 75, it was, from our own, it was just almost an everyday thing. Henry Lee Lucas traveled thousands of miles a year for eight years. Often he had company. This man, Otis Tool, also a serial killer who preferred male victims. Tool brought along his nephew and niece. The children helped to lure victims. When she turned 14, Toole's niece, Becky, became Lucas's child bride. The group traveled the country committing robberies and picking up hitchhikers and killing them. Many victims were tortured and raped before or after death. The killing went on year after year. But in 1982, Lucas killed an 80-year-old woman who was known to have befriended him. That led Texas lawmen to connect him with the crime and arrest him on a weapons charge. Suddenly, he began to confess to hundreds of murders, and he continues to confess. Lucas is kept in this Texas County Jail in care of the Texas Rangers and Sheriff Jim Boutwell. Uh, he was arrested, and after a few days, he decided to start to talk. Uh, that's how I became acquainted with him. I consider myself a friend with the sheriff. I mean, that's unusual to say, but, uh, you know, I do. Do you like him? Well, I don't like what he's done, and he knows that. Uh, I see him on a daily basis and have for uh, over a year now. Uh, we get along. We get along. We get along by not lying to each other and being truthful with each other. So his track record is real good. <laughs> real good or real bad, depending on how you want to look at it. But he is telling the truth. Yes. Yes. He has helped to clear cases in 25 states so far. There have been 101 homicides cleared here in Texas alone. Most victims' families want to know finally and completely what's happened and, uh, and where their loved ones are so they can be given a proper burial. Are you proud of what you've done? No. No. I'm not proud of what I've done. I'm not... Uh happy about what happened. It, uh, I feel there's people out there in this world today that's lost their families, lost their loved ones, and they want to know who done it. And why should I hide my face saying I'm a coward, you know? Uh, I want them to know who I am. 
most of the victims were strangers. Even now, Lucas doesn't know their names. Example, a Texas case. It was an unidentified girl who is still unidentified that was killed on the 30th or 31st of October in 1979. She was left nude in a culvert alongside Interstate 35. I, I say nude, she was wearing a pair of orange socks, and that was it. She was a female in her early 20s, about 5'6", five, 5'7", five, 140 pounds approximately. Lucas said he picked her up hitchhiking in Oklahoma. We don't know who she is, and we'd certainly like to find out, so it can be put to rest. I hope, uh, with my help and with other people's help, that uh, involved in the case, uh, you know, it'll eventually find out who she is. And, uh... Lucas is still traveling, but now he is escorted by armed Texas Rangers. Lawmen say he has an amazingly detailed memory of most crimes. In one California location, Lucas recalled the abduction of two girls. I took them back uh, where the bodies was disposed of and where the grave was dug at for them and uh, how they were left in the grave. And I told them how each one of them had died. Practically every detail, I guess, of that case, except the age. I had the age as 14, 15 years old. All of his description, except the ages of the victims, uh, matched. They were four and five years old. That's the youngest that we know of. Did you strangle these guys? Yeah, they were both strangled. How come you got the age wrong? I don't know. Could you see them in your mind's eye as you were telling the story? Yeah, I could see the girls. Uh, but I couldn't see them at the right age. And just like... Uh, just like he'd growed up there, you know, at the place. That's the first two little kids, I mean, as far as little kids, there were. And, uh, it's just something I don't do. And I couldn't, I still can't figure out why they were five, four and five years old. Is he particularly a violent killer? Yes, many of his killings uh, exhibited a lot of violence, uh, overkill. Very, very violent, very cruel and cases. These little girls, for example. Yeah. Can you tell us anything about that? Yes, they, uh, there was some indication of torture there. Most serial killers have two things that differentiate them from other men. The first is that they take pleasure in inflicting pain, torture, and death on others. And those others are the very people that they regard as sexual objects. That's why the choice of victims is of a particular class, women of a particular age, boys of a particular age. Did you have a, um, a type of victim that was your particular choice? Well, it turned out the younger woman uh, was, but uh, I don't know why. It's important to recognize that there are sizable numbers of people with these preferences who never commit a crime. The reason some of them do is that they are not inhibited against acting on their sadism. Most people have inhibitions that prevent their even thinking such thoughts, and those inhibitions keep us from it. You get so what uh, it becomes a way that uh, you can't get away from. It gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And if I was like I was a year ago, I wouldn't even be safe in this room. Do we all have these impulses within us? Yes. Ever since uh, God made this earth, he, there's been killings. Uh, there's been unsolved killings. There's been murders. There's been rapes. Only through the processes known as socialization, education, and child rearing are we tamed do we have these impulses tamed out of our behavior? Now, this is a complicated process by which human beings from birth are tamed into civilized adults, and it doesn't always work. There are failures in this taming process. If I had to take my best guess of the means to reduce the number of serial killings, I'd say that parents should stop torturing their children. If I didn't do something that I was told to do, I'd beat practically to death.
I've got scars on my body today where I was beaten. And would this come back to you at certain times? Oh, when? Yeah. yeah. Did any of those work to trigger a murder? In some occasions, yeah. Uh, they have. I can actually say during 1960 when Mom uh, died, I actually hated her so bad that the day Mom slapped me, I just wanted her dead. She's somebody that was there to beat and kick and stomp everybody she was around. Had he been given a death penalty after murdering his mother, and had that death penalty been carried out, uh, I'm convinced that today there would be uh, probably 200 or more people still alive. One of Lucas's first murders is supposed to be the murder of his mother. Wouldn't that diffuse his anger against her? The murders never relieve the offender. They always feel that it will. They're looking for the perfect murder, and each one is undertaken with the notion that this will be the ultimate gratification, but it's never good enough. Just as other kinds of sexual activity leave one fulfilled briefly, the desire reemerges and it reemerges fairly soon so that the serial killer is never fulfilled sexually. When did you first get introduced to sex? Uh, from the time I was born, uh, I was raised with it. Uh, had to watch it. Uh, Mom made me watch her have sex with different guys. This has the effect of letting the boy see that mother engages in the kind of behavior that she simultaneously says prostitutes engage in so he can come to hate prostitutes instead of hating his mother directly. Some women I can look at and tell when they're prostitutes and when they're not. And if they're prostitutes, they don't have a chance with me. Are they uh, prostitutes that you knew to be prostitutes? No. Uh, they're people walking the streets, uh, uh, running around with truck drivers, uh, hitchhikers, uh, uh, trying to actually sell herself to me, and uh, I just end up killing them. By the time they're 10 or 12 years old, they're already having fantasies of mutilating women, and mother may be the image in that fantasy until she's replaced with someone else. Now, when's the first time that you killed somebody? When I was 14, back in 51. I had left home, run away from home, and that was a schoolgirl that... Uh, met her on the road and uh, decided I wanted to try sex myself and uh, I tried it and I didn't didn't know what to do afterwards so I strangled the girl to death. And, uh, Was that the first time you had sex with a girl? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you mean you didn't know what to do afterwards? I didn't know what to do, whether to leave her alive so she'd go back and tell her family or whether to uh, kill her or do what, you know, so I just ended up strangling her to death. If one wanted to carry this further and try to ensure that the largest number of boys grew up this way, one would expose large numbers of youths, just as they're developing their sexual identity, to films in which they are sexually aroused by erotic imagery, and then pair that imagery with violence. Films showing teenage babysitters scantily clad as they're murdered would be just the kind of film that could help create that arousal pattern. There is a link between this kind of sadistic, repetitive violence, often expressed in a sexual manner. Uh, I think there's a link between that and the sadomasochistic uh, pornography uh, that has become so pervasive in our society. I won't even go into a sex movie. Uh, they just, uh, just the wrong type of movies, you know. Uh, I just won't go into them. I never cared or have any feelings for sex. Uh, so. I try to force myself not to think of a woman, you know, as, uh, as a sexual thing, you know. Uh, I just uh, feel it's. It's not right. Uh, Sex is not right? Not to me. I consider Becky more my, my wife in a way, but I still wouldn't have sexual relations with her. 
She was with me from about seven years old to, to 15. We slept in the same bed, but uh, she was never touched. I think I touched her once to, uh, back in 82 when we first uh, separated from our other friends and stuff. But that's it. She was never touched again after that. In 1982, Lucas and Becky were traveling alone when she began to argue with him. In the course of the argument, she slapped Henry Lee. His reaction was swift and unthinking. He stabbed her to death and regretted it. The day she slapped me was just like the day Mom slapped me. So fast that there wasn't no, no stopping it. That's one of the deaths that's bothered me the most in any of them at all. It shouldn't have never happened. I guess you can say she's one of the main reasons for me turning out to be what I am today. Is because uh, if she hadn't died, it, it'd still be going on. As far as I know, I can't say positive, but as far as I know, it would. You, you would have continued to kill? Probably would have, yeah. And you think they would have caught you? No. They've been so close to catching me, it's pathetic, and they, they couldn't do it. What can be done to prevent such horrors? We all ask ourselves what could have been done. Could anyone have helped by intervening? Ironically, each of these men gave out a cry for help, and they each came to the attention of authorities. As his prison term for killing his mother came to an end, Lucas told prison authorities not to let him go and predicted he would kill others. Back uh, there in Michigan, you know, and I've told the psychiatrist what I was going to do. I've told the warden what I was going to do. I said, I don't want out there because I know what I'm going to do. And they said, oh, ain't nothing wrong with you going out there. And I get out there, and the first day I get out, I put them a body on their doorstep. There were some killed in the uh, area uh, within a matter of short time after his release. So he did what he said he was going to do? I think he did, yes. Predicting violence is one of the most difficult and elusive things that mental health people are asked to do. Uh, this has led to the unwarranted detainment of, you know, literally thousands of people in mental hospitals because they were dangerous, when in fact we know that they really weren't. Uh, of course, we've heard about the number of mistakes where people were judged not dangerous, and then they go out and kill once again. I had occasion to examine one man released on bail for a kidnapping and an armed robbery, and while on bail, disappeared. While a fugitive, he was admitted to an addiction treatment center on several occasions where no one checked his fingerprints, no one recognized him. He lived in a flop house where there is a police presence, and when they threw him out for fighting there, he told the officer at the door that he was a fugitive on armed robbery and kidnapping charges and wanted to turn himself in for a place to stay. The officer told him to get lost. He found himself in jail one morning, having been arrested while lying intoxicated in the gutter the night before, asked for medical attention for some bruises he had, the jailers told him that he couldn't have that medical attention. They brought another man into the next cell who threatened to hang himself, and when the man I had been examining yelled to the jailers to come down because the man in the next cell was going to hang himself, they told him that they'd be down on their next scheduled rounds as usual, and they continued playing cards. When the man suicided in the next cell, and that was discovered by the jailers, they took him for the medical care he requested. They took him to a hospital across town where they arranged for him to escape. He escaped from that hospital, and of course they didn't want to witness to their negligence and the suicide. He escaped from the hospital, was back on the street, and made another set of rounds looking for help. He even called the police department, asking them to pick him up because he wanted a place to stay again. They told him he'd called the wrong number. They gave him the right number to call. He tried another number and said, come pick me up, I'm a fugitive. They said, we don't provide transportation, you'll have to come in. Desperate for a place to stay, he went home with a man who was known to pay for homosexual favors, and in the course of their evening together, murdered that man. 
multiple opportunities for the criminal justice system and other systems of public service to intervene to provide this man with what he was seeking to prevent this murder. Complete failure. Hinckley also came to the attention of lawmen before he made his assassination attempt. He was arrested at the airport in Nashville, Tennessee in 1980 for carrying handguns through the metal detector. Even though President Carter was in the same city, no one made a connection and Hinckley was released. At that stage, I think that he should have been arrested. Uh, he should have been detained and his behavior after that uh, should have been closely monitored uh, to ensure that he was not stalking a president or another leading political figure. Police had been alerted to Huberty many times over the years. And just the day before the murders, Huberty himself made a call to a local mental health clinic seeking help. But he didn't sound upset enough to get immediate attention. Jim called the, uh, the health clinic here. Yes. But there was a language problem, and they wrote the name down as Schuberty instead of Huberty. And they figured since he was so calm, cool, and collected that there wasn't any problem. Mr. Huberty called the clinic and was asked uh, a series of five questions, which are typical screening questions, and uh, answered all those questions in the negative and did not want to speak about his problem. And, uh, was told that he would be called back for an appointment uh, within a day or two. And uh, that was the nature of the telephone conversation, which happened, of course, the day before the event. Uh, he's described as polite and rational on the phone with no indication at all of any crisis or undergoing any serious uh, uh, mental illness. Maybe a lot of people could be calm, cool, and collected, and there wouldn't be a problem. But I think the mental health clinic should consider if a person takes the time to call a mental health clinic, they definitely have a problem. I mean, most people, there's a stigma connected to calling for mental help. That's a last ditch effort when you call a mental health clinic. And he had made this call. Did anyone ever suggest psychiatric help? Uh, I had told the doctor, our family doctor, about it. And he had given me a prescription for Valium. I mean, you know, if he got uptight, give him a Valium, put him to bed. If he had to go to work, give him a half a Valium so he didn't go to sleep. Did that work? Always. Was he still taking Valium here? I had no access to it here. No prescription? No. He could have said that he had been taking Valium and had no Valium, and that would, would that have been grounds for him to, to be seen immediately? Definitely. <clears throat> Anytime we have patients who have run out of a prescription medicine and their symptoms have returned and are a major focus uh, in the disorder, there would definitely be reasons to, uh, and we get those calls all the time. Is help readily available in this country to people who are violent? It's supposed to be. The reason that there's insufficient help to offer is that little has been done to make the suppression of violence profitable. Violence is profitable, but the treatment of violence isn't. There are many problems dealing with violent patients. One is that they're frightening. Sometimes they threaten or strike out at or even shoot those who are trying to help them. They might not have been able to talk him out of it. I don't think anybody could talk him out of it. But they could have doped him up. You think he wanted that? Yes. I think he didn't want to do it. It's not unusual for an individual who's had a long history of uh, disordered behavior who, when it gets to the point that a, an actual plan has been developed in the mind, to make one last, in a sense, perfunctory call for help. The call for help isn't always to a mental health clinic. Often it's to someplace less appropriate. Sometimes it's a more a cry than a call, namely a uh, statement to friends or neighbors about one, what one plans to do. That's very common. It's we, a cry that's doomed to failure, though. It is for the moment. Ten years ago, people didn't recognize that when someone begins to talk about suicide and make offhand comments about suicide, that that's to be taken seriously. And 
Soon, people will realize that that's true when people talk about homicide and make offhand comments about killing others. Those are to be taken just as seriously as talk about suicide. Which of us will strike out against our families, neighbors, strangers, or politicians? That no one can tell in advance. And no one in our country seriously thinks that anyone who is different, who excites suspicion from neighbors or even the police, should be detained or treated against his will. But then, neither should that person be ignored. It's a question of connecting effectively with whatever help exists. I mean, you can't just grab somebody that's different and say, well, we got to do away with them or do something. But I mean, in, in a case where the person shows a little bit of violence, um, or quite a bit of violence, you know, I think people should be able to uh, get together and, and maybe say, well, this man needs help. I think that may have prevented uh, Huberty from doing what he did, maybe. I don't know, but people don't want to get involved a lot of times, so they leave it go. And I, I think that if uh, there's any other cases like this in the United States, people ought to be a little bit more careful. And, you know, I'm sorry now that I didn't speak up before this happened. The Police Tapes is a work of daring and intelligence. Shocking. Infuriating. Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Disgusting. And absurdly funny. I'm not taking no nonsense from none of them in here. Well, did you hit that door? Yes, I did hit it. Yeah, but you shouldn't do that. And this is what I hit it with. The original inspiration for the award-winning series Hill Street Blues. That's it. That's the end of the story. Let's be careful out in the street. Let's go. And the successful film Fort Apache, the Bronx. The policeman fundamentally has a ringside seat on the greatest show on earth. The police tapes comes to home video for the first time. Who has got the gun? He's got the gun. He took the gun and everything. Gun? Sit ringside to the stark black and white reality of police work in the nation's toughest crime area. The 44th Precinct, South Bronx. Witness volatile tensions as a man holds his mother hostage at gunpoint. I didn't have no gun. You can't put oh, gun on me. Where a woman is accused of hitting her daughter with an axe. The mother allegedly picked up an axe and hit her in the face with an axe. And where gang murders are the local law of revenge. Once they come over here, we get them. Once they come over here, we get them. Meet the real life heroes, the men of the 44th Precinct, who struggle to keep the South Bronx together. The police tapes needs to be seen by just about everyone. <laughs>